scripture and you will be taken from Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 through 29. And I'll be reading from the New King James Version. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Good morning. Good to see everybody today. It is a hot one. It's been hot for the last few days. And I don't know what I like, what I hate worse, I should say, whether it's the, the cold, cold of winter or the miserable hot of July and August. I, I hate them both. I'd rather have. <laughs> Sunny and 70 degrees suits me just fine, but we, I guess we'll get what we get and thank God for it because it's, it's all part of the changing of the seasons, and, but at any rate, we're glad that you're here today and uh, we always are open to your questions. If you have seen anything here today you don't understand, would like to know more about, we'd be happy to discuss it with you, and if you hear anything in my sermon uh, that you don't understand or maybe disagree with, let me know about that. We'd be happy to discuss it with you with an open mind and Bible. We invite you to come back at all of our services. We'll meet tonight at 5 o'clock. Uh, this being the first Sunday of the month, we'll have another worship service similar to this morning. Uh, normally, we have Bible classes at that time. That will be the Sunday following and, and, and the Sundays after that until the beginning of next month. And then on Wednesday nights, we generally have Bible study, but this Wednesday, I believe, will be our singing night. So uh, let's all tune our voices up and be here to pr sing praises to God on Wednesday night. But anyway, thank you for coming. I want to talk to you about having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. In Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 through 29, uh, we, it, I think the passage indicates that our relationship is a personal one. And the reason I say that is particularly found in verse 27. He says, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. That shows that we form a relationship with Christ on a very individual basis, on a personal basis. And I think that's very important. I'm going to throw in a bonus passage. I don't have it in your notes on the back of a family report. But if you'll flip with me over to Revelation 3, verse 20, just a second. Here's another passage. It indicates that our relationship with Jesus is a very, very personal one. Jesus actually is addressing a congregation, but notice that in so doing, He also addresses the individual members. In verse 20, He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any one hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. And that indicates a very personal thing, a personal relationship. We hear that all the time. Now that phrase isn't found in the Bible, by the way, uh, but we hear that all the time. We've got to have a personal relationship with Jesus. And I know the words aren't there, but I believe, they, I believe the sentiment is. I believe the sentiment of having a personal relationship with Jesus is biblical. And so we want to sort of examine that a little bit and talk about that a little bit this morning. And then think about you as, as the sermon draws to a close. Think about yourself. Do you have this relationship with Jesus? And if not, uh, I'll tell you how you can fix that in a jiffy at the end of this sermon. So let's talk about that this morning. The first thing I, I, I want to emphasize is that Jesus is a person. We sometimes we think of persons as just being human beings, and that's really not true. Uh, divinity is a person as well. Deity is a person. And so though Jesus is deity, he's also a person. Well, what in the world is a person? I did a little research in the dictionary, and I found this definition. A being or entity having distinctive emotional or behavioral characteristics. And you can see how that would apply to human beings for sure. But you can also see how it would apply to deity, to Jesus in particular. And you think about some of Jesus' personal characteristics, and we could go on for days just on that. But I just listed a few here uh, for us to think about. Jesus exhibits the characteristic of love. Uh, he had said uh, that greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And so he exhibits the personal characteristic of love. He exhibits the characteristic of compassion in one occasion uh, the Bible said Jesus had compassion on the multitudes because they appeared to be like sheep having no shepherd. And so he exhibits compassion. Uh, Jesus exhibits mercy. 
When they brought to Jesus in John chapter 8 a woman taken in adultery and, and they tried to get Jesus to make a judgment on the situation, it, it appears at the end of that that he has compassion on the woman. Uh, he tells her to sin no more and that's very important to understand, but he also, it seems, has compassion upon that woman. Jesus uh, shows the characteristic of forgiveness. On one occasion, uh, they brought a man uh, who, who was, uh, he, he was, he was, he couldn't walk. And so they carried him up to the roof, and they tore open the roof, and they lowered him down. And Jesus told that man, he said, your son, your sins are forgiven. And he did that on a number of occasions. He would just forgive people of their sins. And that's a characteristic of personality. It's a personal characteristic. Jesus also exhibits the, the characteristic of wrath. We forget about that side of Jesus. But there was a wrathful side to Jesus. Remember when he overturned the tables of the money changers in the temple? He got angry. And he overturned the tables and he said, get these things out of here. Do not turn my father's house into a house of merchandise. And he exhibits the characteristic of judgment. Uh, in Matthew 24, he talked about a judgment coming upon the nation of Jerusalem. And in Matthew 25, he talked about a final judgment coming upon humanity. And so these are just some of the personal characteristics that Jesus has. Now, the interesting thing about Jesus as a person is that this is the most unique person that you have ever seen in your life. There is no one like Jesus. He's unique because he has the characteristics of God and man. You see, his Father only has the characteristics of deity. The Holy Spirit only has the characteristics of deity. You and I only have the characteristic of, of humanity, but Jesus was a blended being. He had the characteristics of both God and man. Take your Bibles and turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy 2 and Paul is talking about the need for prayer uh, in their public assemblies in the church in that day and time. But he, he comes on down here in about verse 5 and he talks about the mediatorial work of Jesus. Jesus as mediator, uh, we sometimes miss the boat on that, really doesn't have anything to do with our prayers. It has to do with his offering on the cross. And 1 Timothy 2, 5 and 6 makes that very clear. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Well, how was he a mediator? Verse 6, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. That was how Jesus mediated a relationship between God and man. But the idea of a mediator is a go-between. You have two parties that are at odds, you see. They're, they're, in, they're at odds in some way, in some form, and God and man certainly is. God expects holiness and man falls far short. And so Jesus, as a mediator, is trying to mediate a relationship between the two. And he's the perfect person for the job. Think of that. Because as God, as deity, he can represent God and his interests. He, he does that flawlessly and perfectly. And as man, and, and, and having lived a life on the earth and being tempted, he knows what it is to be tempted. He knows what we go through. He understands our position. And so he's the perfect guy to come between God and man. There is no one like Jesus. This is, if you want to have a relationship with anyone, this is the person you want to have a relationship with right here. The most unique individual in the universe. Turn, if you will, now to Colossians 1 and look at some of the interesting things it says here about Jesus. We studied this a few months back in a sermon. It says in verse 15 through 18, speaking of Jesus, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by Him all things were created that are in heaven, that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through Him and for Him. And He is before all things, and in Him all things consist. And He's the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Most of those qualities that are listed there have to do with his divinity, but there toward the end it talks about being the firstborn from the dead, a reference to his resurrection, also a reference to his humanity, and all of these are talking about the preeminence of Christ, the, the fact that he is the center of the universe and the most unique individual in that universe. And so Jesus is a person. So we're talking about having a relationship with that person. And imagine that, the one who created all things, uh, the one who sustains all things, the one who has always been. He's never, there's never been a time when there wasn't a Jesus. He has always been. He's eternal. And you're going to have a relationship, a personal relationship with this person. That's amazing to me. 
But if you think about that, I just wanted to establish the fact that Jesus is a person, and therefore, bringing me to my next point, any relationship with Jesus of necessity is a personal one. You can't avoid that. There's no avoiding that. If Jesus is a person, and he is, we've established that. We looked at the personal characteristics of Jesus. And so any relationship that you have with Jesus of necessity is a personal relationship. And this is critical for us to understand. Because we're not talking about, listen to me carefully here, we're not talking about having a relationship with other people who have a relationship with Jesus. Now that's part of it. But that's not really what we're addressing here. But there are people who think that they're right with Jesus and they're right with God because they have a relationship with other people who are right. In other words, they sit in a church house. How many times have we, have we had people who have that very attitude? They won't say it in that way, but, but they have that, clearly have that attitude. Well, I know I'm right because I go to the church of Christ. That's the attitude they seem to have. And they miss the whole point here. And you've heard me say before, and I don't know where I stole it, uh, but I stole it from somebody. It said, sitting in a church house will no more make you a Christian than sitting in a hen house will make you a hen. That's such an important lesson. You're not in a relationship with Jesus because you're sitting out here in this audience. You're not in a relationship with Jesus because you're meeting in a church that has a sign out front that says Church of Christ. That doesn't make you have a relationship with Jesus. That's really more of what could be called churchianity instead of Christianity. There's a difference. There's churchianity where everything revolves around church, 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 and as long as everything with the church is okay, then everything is okay with Jesus. And then there's Christianity when it's Jesus, 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 Jesus. And as long as everything's right between me and Jesus, now we're getting somewhere, you see. There's a big difference between the two, and I think it's very, very important. Doesn't mean the church is not important. Doesn't mean the church isn't part of God's plan. But what I'm saying to you is Jesus has to take the primacy. Jesus has to take the front seat. Jesus has to be the focus. This relationship is direct between me and Jesus, and this relationship is personal. Years ago, and I don't remember the words to the song, but I remember the title to the song, Tom T. Hall used to sing a song, Me and Jesus Got Our Own Thing Going. There's a, there is a truth to that. Now, that can be perverted. That can be per per perverted, and that song may even pervert it. I don't remember the words to the song. But there is a truth to that. Me and Jesus got our own thing going. This is not, it doesn't have anything to do. Your relationship with Jesus has nothing to do with me. And my relationship to Jesus has nothing to do with you. It is direct. It is personal. No one can form your relationship with Jesus but you. I can't form a relationship with Jesus for you. Nobody else can form a relationship with Jesus for you. Only you can form that relationship. And the same thing goes for me. Only I can form a relationship with Jesus. You can't form that relationship for me. The reverse of that's also true. If you have a relationship with Jesus, nobody can break that relationship but you. I can't break your relationship with Jesus. Sometimes people kid themselves and they want to blame other people for their, for their failure to be a faithful Christian. Well, the church offended me or someone at church offended me as though someone else could break your relationship to Jesus. No one can break your relationship to Jesus but you. And no one can break my relationship to Jesus but me. It is direct and it is very personal. No one can form it and no one can break it. It's just me and Jesus. That's what we're talking about here, and it is very critical. Now, sometimes, this is where this thing gets off the wheels just a little bit. Sometimes people take this phrase, personal relationship with Jesus, and they twist it around and pervert it to mean, I get to make the rules. Well, having a personal relationship with Jesus does not mean that. It doesn't mean I can have my religion my way. That's not at all what it means. In John, the 14th chapter, and we know the verse, we've heard it many, many times, funerals, sermons, Bible classes, but John 14 and verse 6, and, and just for a little context, verse 5, Thomas said, Lord, we don't know where you're going. Jesus just told him he was going to his father's house. Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said, I am the way. I am the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. 
And what that means is, even though I have a personal relationship with Jesus, I don't dictate the terms of the relationship. I don't get to do that. I don't get to decide my own morality. That's a lesson a lot of uh, professing Christians need to learn. You don't get to decide what's moral and what isn't. I don't get to decide how I'm going to worship God. You, that's not up to us. That's already spelled out for us in Scripture. Jesus makes that decision. I don't make that decision. How, do, how am I going to live my life? How am I going to worship God? How am I going to serve God in my day-to-day life? I don't get to make that call. That call's already been made by Jesus. He is the way. And that's why the Bible tells us in Colossians 3 and verse 17, whatever you do in word or deed, Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. That means by His authority, recognizing His right to rule over you. And that, of course, brings me to my next point. And this point, I think, is very, very critical. Any relationship with Jesus is an unequal relationship. And if you just stop and think about it, point one tells us why that is. Because Jesus is deity, you see. The relationship is unequal. You don't approach Jesus as an equal. You know, there's a, if you turn on your TV and you listen to some of these TV preachers, they talk about, I think they call it the name it and claim it religion. The name it and claim it. You just name your blessing and you claim it as though somehow or another you got power over the Lord. Nuh-uh, no such thing. No such thing. You don't get to dictate. The relationship with Jesus is unequal. He is God and I am not. That automatically makes the the relationship unequal. And it means this, that one of the two parties in this relationship between me and Jesus is in the power position. And guess who that is? It isn't me, and it isn't you. The person in the power position in this relationship is Jesus. In the book of Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians 5, Paul uses that very famous parallel between the relationship of husband and wife and the relationship of Christ and His church. And by the way, His church is just all of those individuals who have a personal relationship with Jesus. That's what the church is. All of those individuals who have a personal relationship with Jesus. And in Ephesians 5, 23, Paul, using that parallel illustration, for the husband is the head of the wife as also Christ is the head of the church and He is the Savior of the body. In the family, the husband is in the power position, according to Scripture. Now, our feminists, they bristle at that. Oh, I don't like that. Well, I'm sorry. That's what the Bible says. That's what the Bible says. The husband is in the power position, as far as God is concerned, as far as the way God has set it up. And likewise, even so, Christ is in, he's the head of the church. He's in the power position. And so your relationship with Jesus is on an unequal basis. You don't approach Jesus as an equal. You approach Jesus as a subordinate. You approach Jesus as someone who yields to His authority, someone who obeys Him. That's the whole picture that's being painted. And there's another uh, expression in the Bible that I think describes, you think the word relationship. Let me just put that in biblical language for you. It's a covenant. It's a covenant. Marriage is a covenant, isn't it? A husband and wife make a covenant to one another, a lifetime covenant, binding for life making that vow before God Himself. And so it's a covenant. Well, our relationship with Jesus is a covenant relationship. There's there's promises made. The person in the power position, that's Jesus, makes certain promises. If you enter into this relationship with me, I will do this, and I will do this, and I will do this. And then He puts out the requirements. If you're going to enter this relationship, you must do this and this and this. So that's, that's called a covenant. In Matthew, the 26th chapter, and we just did this this morning, by the way. We took the Lord's Supper. In Matthew, the 26th chapter, Jesus was instituting that supper. And He took the bread, and He said, this is my body. And then He took the cup, and He said, this is my blood. Look at this in verse 28. Matthew 26 and verse 28, talking about the cup, really the contents of the cup, the fruit of the vine. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. I want you to understand something about this relationship. It's an unequal relationship, but Jesus wants it so bad. He wants a relationship with you so bad, a personal relationship with you, yes, you, so bad, that He went to the cross to have it. 
You see, he couldn't have it because sin makes this little barrier between us and God. There's a, there's a problem there. We've got sin in our life. That has to be removed before we can even talk about having a relationship. And he went to the cross just so you could have a personal relationship with him. To, have, to enter into a covenant relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Getting back to my earlier statement then, I don't get to dictate terms. Turn back to Acts chapter 2 for just a second. Acts chapter 2. This is the first time this, re this covenant relationship is offered to humanity. The very first time. Think of that. Jesus has gone to the cross, and He's been resurrected, and He's ascended back to heaven, and now for the very first time, people can enter into this covenant relationship, this new covenant. Now, there was an old, but this is the new covenant relationship for the very first time. And Peter is preaching on this day, and notice how he indicts the people of their sin in verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. You've done a terrible thing. You've killed an innocent man. Yea, more than that, you've killed the Son of God. And yet God has taken that man that you just murdered and raised him from the dead and made him Lord and Christ. The next verse gives us their reaction. When they heard this, they were cut to the heart and they said, Too bad. No. They said, men and brethren, what shall we do? We've, we've grieved, grievously sinned here. We've made a terrible mistake. How can we patch this up? And how can we have a relationship with God? And Peter said, repent and let every one of you be baptized. Now catch this, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That phrase, in the name of Jesus Christ, is very important. It means by His authority. It isn't just Peter that's saying, repent and be baptized. He's saying that by the authority of or in the name of Jesus. Peter didn't make that up. He's speaking in the name of Jesus. And guess what Jesus is doing? He's dictating terms. You want to be forgiven? You want to enter in a relationship with me? You're going to have to repent of your sins. And you're going to have to be baptized. Oh, but he's not done. He, he says in verse 40, With many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. And those who gladly received his word were baptized. You know what that means? They entered into a personal relationship. You see, you're baptized one at a time, aren't you? One person at a time. And one person at a time entering into a relationship with Jesus. This one, and then that one, and then another one. And then the next verse says, They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. This is their faithfulness afterwards. They came up out of that watery grave and continued on in a life of faithfulness. And all of those terms, not dictated by me, not dictated by you, but dictated by Jesus. The relationship is on an unequal basis. You approach Jesus as a subordinate. And you think, I mentioned earlier, when you enter a covenant relationship, the one in the power position makes certain promises. Think about the promises Jesus has made. I'll forgive you of all of your sins. Wiped clean, the record gone. I'll listen to your prayers. I don't care when you want to talk to me. Middle of the night, middle of the day, early morning, late in the evening, dinner time, supper time, breakfast time. I don't care. You, whenever you want to talk to me, I'll listen to your prayers. I'll guide you with my word, and I'll guide you in my good providence. I'll protect you. I'll watch over you. I, I, I will, when this life is over, I'll raise you from the dead, and I'll bring you up to heaven with me. And we can have a relationship that stretches on through eternity. Now I'm just scratching the hem of the garment here, just touching the surface of the thing. But Jesus is making these promises. But to have those promises, you have to understand who's in the power position. You have to understand who dictates the terms, and His terms are clear. Repent and be baptized. Continue in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Let's get down to some more nitty-gritty here about the details of having a personal relationship with Jesus. If this is something that interests you, may I suggest that first of all, if you're going to have a personal relationship with Jesus, you need to know who He is. A lot of people go through life and they talk about Jesus and, and, and mention Jesus, but they don't really know Him. you got to get to know the guy. You can't have a relationship with Jesus if you don't know Him. That's why I said earlier, it's a little bit more than just attending church services and, and checking off boxes of, of praying and singing and, and putting money into play. You've got to know this guy. You've got to get, if you're going to have a relationship with him, you've got to get to know him. 
Turn your Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 1. By the way, while we're turning there, if you're going to get to know Jesus, can I recommend to you the four Gospels? Where else are you going to get to know Him? This is His life. This is His life story found in Matthew, in Mark, in Luke, in John, written by four different individuals, telling us of His birth and, and of His life and of His miracles and of His teachings and His parables and all the things that He did and His death and His burial and His resurrection. All of that is getting to know Jesus. Get to know this guy. And John, he gives us some fantastic information here. First five verses. In the beginning was the Word. He's speaking of Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. That last statement, I said a lot of people go through life, and, and they mention Jesus, and they know about Jesus, but they don't comprehend Him. They don't know Him. You see, they, they have no clue who He is. They don't really, they, oh, He was a good man, or He was a philosopher, or, or He was, he was a, a, a Jew uh, 2,000 years ago, but He doesn't really have any, any meaning to me. They don't comprehend, you see. And John's trying to tell us, this guy is de de deity. He's God. He's the Creator. Drop down here to verse 10. He was in the world. He spent 33 years in this world. He was in the world, and the world was made through Him, and the world did not know Him. Most people say, Jesus? Who is that? Or worse, Jesus, I could care less. That's what a lot of people say. The world didn't know Him. He came to His own. And his own did not receive him. There's two ways to look at that. He came to the Jews and the Jews received him. But you could expand that. He came to his own world, to his own people. And the people, not just the Jews, but the people did not receive. No one, nothing to do with you, Jesus. Ain't interested in you, Jesus. But he says, as many as received him. There are those who get it. There are those where the light bulb goes off in their brain. And they, and they understand who this person is. As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, or will of man but of God. Born of God, born again, born into the family of God. That's that relationship. And he says there are some people who get it, and they want that. But if you, you're only going to get it if you comprehend. You're only going to get it if you know who he is. You've got to know a little bit about Jesus. And you've got to know that he really wants a relationship with you. Jesus said in, in Luke 19 and verse 10, The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Why did, he, why did God come down here and put on a, a garment of flesh and dwell among us for 33 years? And why did God allow His own creation to mock Him and to falsely accuse Him and to spit upon Him and to scourge Him and to nail Him to a tree and let Him hang there till He died? Why did He do that? He wants a personal relationship with you. That's why He did it. You see, God, time has no meaning to God. He saw all of this from the beginning. He sees you, He sees me from the beginning. And He wants a relationship with Lanny Smith. He wants a relationship with Al Easter. He wants a relationship with Randy Schaus. He wants a relationship with Effie Easter. He wants a relationship with Sandy Burleson. That's why he came. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. That's me. I was lost until Jesus found me. In John 15, 13, Jesus said, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. He wants that relationship so bad, as I said earlier, that he went to the cross to make it happen. And that's why it's called a covenant. It was, it was ratified by blood. Covenants in, in, in the Bible were always ratified by blood. An animal had to die. There was a blood sacrifice. And Jesus was that spotless lamb who ratified a covenant so he could have a relationship with me and with you. Now, how do I initiate that relationship? I told you at the beginning of the lesson that you're going to have a chance. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus, you're going to have a chance to initiate that relationship this morning. How do I initiate a relationship with Jesus? Two passages. Romans 6, verses 3 and 4. In fact, just for a little context, let's go all the way back to verse 1 in Romans 6. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? That's what a lot of people believe. 
Doesn't matter how you live. Let's just keep on sinning because God's got plenty of grace. He says, verse 2, certainly not. Absolutely not. That's not the way it's going to be. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Into Christ Jesus. Now, you're not, that's not a literal expression. Jesus is in heaven and we're on the earth. You're not in Jesus in any literal sense. If you write in your Bibles where it says into Christ, just put in there, in that, in that bet between there, into a relationship with Christ. That's what we're talking about here. Baptized into a relationship with Christ. Don't forget that first part, though. You've got to die to your sins. Remember that? How shall we who died to sins live any longer there? You've got to die to your sins. And then you're baptized into a relationship with Christ. Verse 4. Therefore we were buried with Him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. You see, everything's changed when you're baptized. Your relationship has changed. Now you're in a relationship with Jesus. Your sins are gone. Your lifestyle has changed. That old man has been put to death. That old man has been buried. And you come up and you walk now in a new life. You've changed directions. In Galatians 3, 26 and 27, the other passage. I told you there were two. Here's the other one. And it was, it, that brings us back where we started. He said in verse 26, For you're all sons of God, through faith in Christ Jesus. Tell us why that is, Paul, verse 27. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ, once again, into a relationship with Christ, that's what that means. As many of you were baptized into a relationship with Christ, you've put on Christ. That's how you enter that relationship. But there's a little bit more involved than just entering. The relationship has to be maintained. Isn't that true of all of our relationships? You have a relationship with your wife, but if you never talk to her, the relationship kind of sours, doesn't it? Kind of falls apart. In order to maintain a relationship with your spouse, you have to continue to be around them and expose yourself to them, and you have to kind of talk to them and get to know them. See, same thing with Jesus. You can enter a relationship, but you've got to maintain it. You've got to maintain a relationship with Jesus. It doesn't just happen and then stay fixed. It has to be maintained. In John, the 15th chapter, Jesus spoke of this under the metaphor of the vine and the branches. We're very familiar with that. He says in John 15, I am the true vine, my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch, and he's talking about you and me, those of us who have that personal relationship, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. You're done. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me. Let me translate. Maintain that relationship. Maintain that relationship. Abide in me. And I and you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I am him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, not maintaining the relationship... He is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. He's referring there to the fires of eternal torment. Don't be one of those who aren't producing, who aren't maintaining, who aren't keeping up the relationship, and then to be gathered up into the fire and burned for all eternity. Don't be in that crowd. Maintain the relationship with Jesus Christ. Over in the book of 1 John, we see the same idea brought out in a different metaphor, the metaphor of walking. Scripture uses that metaphor a lot. And walking is, walking is not a step. It's not stepping. It's walking. Okay, So it's a continuous thing. And it goes on. And in 1 John 1, 5, he talks about this relationship and how God wanted it here. This is the message which we've heard from Him and declare to you that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with Him, fellowship's just another word for relationship. If we claim to have a relationship with Him and we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Why? You're not maintaining the relationship. You're letting it fall apart. You're letting it, you're letting it deteriorate. But if we walk in the light, if we maintain it, if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship. We have a relationship with one another, me and Jesus. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. 
But if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There must be a continuing, there must be a maintaining, and yes, you're going to bungle. He says that in verse 8. We say we have no sin, we deceive our... You're going to make your mistakes, but there's a way to fix that. And that's part of maintaining the relationship. Confess, verse 9, confess those sins. Repent of those sins. Let God know that you're sorry for what you've done. And so these are the, the basic details of having that relationship with Jesus. I would suggest to you that that's actually the goal of Scripture, isn't it? If you stop and think about it. This is, what God, this is why God gave us a Bible. Because He's telling us all about His activities in this world and His interest in mankind and, and the sending of His Son to die to, to establish this relationship. This, the, the whole Bible was given so that we can have a personal relationship with Jesus. That's the goal of Scripture. And that relationship is going to extend beyond this world into eternity. While here, He's trying to work with us and make us everything we can be. Years ago, they used to have a, a, an army ad on the TV. Some of you may remember that. Be all that you can be. Remember that? That's what the Lord wants you, for you. He wants you to be all that you can be. He wants you to be the best that you can be. He, he, he wants to work with you and mold you and shape you and make you better with each passing day. And this is all about a relationship. You know how married couples, as time goes by, they get to where they can finish one another's sentences and they know what one another's thinking, and they know how that's going to react to this, and, and she knows how I'm going to react to that. Why? Because we've had this relationship all these years, and we know each other intimately. That's what we're talking about here. You know Jesus intimately. You know Him very closely. You know Him inside out, and He knows you inside and out, and, you have, and He's working with you and molding you and making you and shaping you and fitting you for heaven because someday we're going there to the better place. And we'll dwell with Him for all eternity. But it starts right here. And to have a personal relationship, you've got to make a personal choice. I can't make the choice for you. I can't form the relationship for you. It's up to you. God's done His part. And we've done our part in presenting that information to you. And now it's up to you to make a personal choice. Do you leave here today without a relationship with Christ? Or will you change today? and establish that relationship, and start down the pathway to heaven. It's our hope and desire that you'll make the latter choice, that you'll make the choice to form the relationship with Jesus, and let Him work with you until the day of eternity. You won't be disappointed, I guarantee it. If you're subject to the invitation, come now while we stand and while we sing.